think Howard, we're ready to get going. Thank you. Great. Welcome, everyone, to today's event. I'm Howard Taylor, the Executive Director of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. And for those of you not so familiar with the End Violence Partnership, the End Violence Partnership and Fund is a 600 member global platform for evidence based and collaborative advocacy action and investment to tackle all forms of violence against children in every setting and in every country. For many children, child helplines are a lifeline. 30 million calls are placed to child helplines every year. And last year, during the COVID-19 pandemic, that number went up by as much as 50%. But although child helplines are vital, resource constraints and technology gaps means that too often, children's calls go unanswered. Last fall, last autumn, we invested over $10 million in 15 partners, all using cutting edge technology to tackle online violence and abuse of children across the world. One of those partners is Tech Matters, who are working to bridge the gap between children's needs and the availability of support via helplines. And Tech Matters has applied a new technology, our SALO, in South Africa and Zambia. And through our SALO, child helplines are now able to use the power of technology to prevent, to identify and respond to child abuse. And in so doing, streamlining the process, both for counselors and for children. So our SALO is poised to revolutionize countries' child helpline systems, and in doing so, make a substantial contribution to ending all forms of violence, abuse, and exploitation of children wherever they may live. As you may gather, we are very excited about our SALO and this initiative, but not only because of the impact it will have on children's lives, but also because collaboration across many organizations has been at the heart of bringing our SALO to life. I know that working with Child Helpline International Tech Matters has harnessed the expertise of those who really know the child helpline world best. And they've pooled those partners' expertise with their own to create this groundbreaking technological tool, which we'll hear more about today. So it's great to be here today, both to recognize the progress with our SALO, to hear more about the journey so far, but also to look forward, I think, with great ambition to the wider impact that our SALO can have for so many children around the world. And today's event is also an affiliate event of the Together to End Violence Campaign and Solutions Summit series, which aims to raise awareness about all forms of violence and abuse of children, to share what's working, to tackle, to prevent and respond to it, and to secure new political and financial commitments to end violence against children. And I'll say a little bit more about Together to End Violence later on the call. But it's now my great privilege to welcome you all again to today's event, and to introduce Jim Fruchterman, the Chief Executive Officer of Tech Matters. Jim. Thank you very much, Howard. And thank you everyone for joining us. I also want to thank the End Violence team who's been going out of their way to help us out in terms of getting this, this project underway and obviously being a major funder. Um, I want to give you uh, attendees a, a run of, uh, of our one hour section today, our event today. Um, so, so basically, uh, I will be starting off by interviewing Jeru Bilamoria, the founder of Childline India and Child Helpline International, about how a silo got started and what Jeru's ambitious vision is for the future of this technology. Um, I'll then explain what a silo is, a uh, few, few of its sort of major, major elements. We'll give a live demonstration. Um, we'll talk something about the values of the silo, and then we'll bring in more of our partners. And I think, as Howard mentioned, Co-creation has been a critical element of how a SALO has gotten going. And so, so we'll be hearing uh, from Patrick Krenz, uh, the Executive Director of Child Helpline International, as well as Dumasili Nala, um, who's the Chief Executive of Childline, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> Childline South Africa, um, who's been one of the earliest adopters. And then we'll take <clears throat> a few questions and then we'll wrap up with um, uh, how, final remarks from Howard. And I need a glass of water. Mm, that helps a lot. So, um, so let me uh, let me bring up our, our slides, and I'm going to uh, start off by talking with Jeru. And so, um, Jeru, uh, you're the you're the reason why a CLO came into being. Um, 
a little bit less than three years ago, you grabbed me at a conference and said that I needed to be paying attention. So could you share what you had in mind when you grabbed a, a nerd from Silicon Valley and said, I want you to think about child health lines. And, yeah. and I'm on mute. Technology <laughs> is not my strong point. So you all understand why I went to gym in the first place. Well, having started the child helpline in India and CHI, I realized that helplines are on one hand phone services for children, but on another hand, they are actually technology partners. They are cutting edge technology innovations because the better the technology, the better the quality of service we can offer. So I think that has been my premise all through. And um, when we had started with Childline India and when we were doing CHI also, we had used a lot of cutting edge technology and our helplines across the world do use a lot of technology, mm -hmm. but we were not cracking the fundamental problem, which was reaching as many children as possible at the lowest cost possible with the best quality of service. And more important to me, which is documenting that so that you could use it for advocacy and systems change. So having this many, many, like almost like a laundry list of things, though there were just six priorities, I went to Jim and said, build something which will allow us to do that. So double the calls at half the cost. That's what we need. And lots of data which we can advocate with to bring about systems change and more importantly, get it done as soon as possible. So I think that's what I went to with Jim. And then I, that was not enough of a list. I said, hey, Jim, in addition to that, we are very co-creative and facilitative. That means you have to respond to and listen to the whole CHI network as you develop. So that was the challenge I gave to Jim and he delivered. Well, and, and, and thank you, Drew. And so, so what Drew did is she, she brought us to the International Consultation of Child Helpline International, which is every two years, all the helplines of the world get together. And we basically, Drew, got the membership to approve a joint effort to build a new shared contact center platform. And the idea was, if, if we could build this together, that you know, it would enable people to have better technology that would actually cost them less. And so... Right after that, we, we went out and we talked to 25 of the chief executives of, of different helplines around the world, and we heard a, a, a lot of the similar problems that they actually had. And so, so what we were able to say is, all right, there's a common theme here, the sorts of things that we need to do. And as you'll figure out, everything that we're building in a silo is there because a child helpline or several have asked for that feature. We put out a, a call for people to help us actually actively co-create this, as I called it, uh, testing progressively less broken software for, uh, for 18 months. And we had more than 25 helplines apply. 10, we could only handle 10, so we picked 10. And they've been helping us since November, 2019. So every four to six weeks, we've issued a new release of that software and they test it and they give us feedback. We also were able to raise some significant amount of money to actually build this and obviously share this cost across, across the entire network. And so um, we got early funding from Schmidt Futures, uh, Twilio.org, Facebook, Genesis Group, uh, obviously uh, Child Helpline International also um, funded some of the early work here. And uh, the End Violence Fund uh, gave us sort of the, the funding to actually launch a silo in two countries. And you're gonna hear much more about that later today. But so, so uh, Drew, I think um, now that we've got you, um, as, as you can tell, Drew's ambitious for what technology could actually do. Drew, could you give us some of the ideas of, of what you're encouraging us to, to consider uh, going forward once, once we get, you know, 30 or 40 child helplines off the ground with a silo? Well, A, first, Howard, you would be very happy because can you imagine data from 30 or 40 helplines and what that you could do for policy advocacy? But beyond that, my real dream is what's put over there on the screen, a helpline <laughs> in a box. That means any organization wanting to be able to start a helpline, and I should not use the word download an app or Jim will murder me, but will be able to get there to a platform and be able to open something with a few clicks and a few steps. This means that we're making technology accessible 
to the last mile, we are creating a framework for data collection, which can then be used for global policy change. Can you imagine if we were able to do it for gender-based helplines, we were able to do it for disability, we were able to do it for um, uh, something related to sexual, any issue you take it, if we could do it and it was affordable, the data we could have would actually be the voices of the people and the people calling to say, have we achieved the SDGs or not? What more powerful tool can we have? And Jim, you have to build that as soon as we can raise all the money for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I, I think Drew, one, of the, one of the things is that anytime that we invest money in developing technology for the nonprofit sector, the idea is that it's going to have at least a 10x you know, return on investment because uh, frankly, there's a lot of opportunities to do good. And so we're going to be talking about a lot of those sort of investments. But, but I think one of the things that, you know, helpline in a box, the idea that if, if a crisis came up, that you could start a new helpline in a week or a day, um, I mean, th those same investments we're already starting to make because it used to, it used to take us six months to start a helpline early on. Now we're trying to figure out how to do it in three months. And next it'll be one month. And then, you know, and the idea is that you can make these things happen more quickly. And, and of course, if you can stand it up and start responding to people in need, you can always make it better. So, well. And you would have the data. That's the most important. You would you know, have and, the data to make the change. And I think, I think we'll be hearing more about this uh, as we discuss what's going on inside of CELO, because one of the key strategies of Child Helpline International is how we can aggregate data across borders and, and use it to more effectively advocate. And I think, I think that'll be a theme that you'll hear a lot more. So, well, Jeru, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for getting me going on this. And now what I'm gonna do is, is talk a little bit more about what is this thing that we've been discussing? So a, a CELO is the equivalent of what a modern big for-profit international company would have in its contact center. It's that for instead of being used to sell products or do tech support, uh, or, or, or schedule deliveries or get you picked up by uh, an Uber or a Lyft, we're doing it so that we can actually help children and eventually help a much larger group of people in the crisis response field. So, so first of all, it's not just a voice um, call center. It's, a, it's an omni-channel contact center. What that means is whatever platform children are on, they can reach out to the helpline and get assistance. Uh, because I think people have noticed um, many young people are not as big into uh, voice calls as they are into text. So we want to be there for them on SMS and WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and secure web chat in addition to voice. And we're already getting asked to, to add other social media text channels. So that's that's an important thing. We want when, whenever someone decides they need some help, wherever they are, we want them to be able to essentially open the door to a helpline. We recognize from our conversations with, with helpline executives that it needs to be customizable and it has to be customizable in a lot of different ways. So this isn't just language and the branding and the messages that a helpline has, but also has to be about operating philosophy. We have to simultaneously be able to help an anonymous helpline that collects very little data about the children that are calling them, as well as a, a helpline that does full case-based management of, of basically tracking children who need follow-up, who, who are basically uh, in danger of violence and they need, you know, they need to be... Uh, into the social work system. They need to be, uh, assaults need to be reported to the police, whatever the particular set is. Um, I think you've already heard from, from Jeru. It's about how can we help um, twice as many kids with half as much resources? Uh, our target is tripling uh, the effectiveness of counselors because counselors are the, the limited resource in this system. And so you'll, you'll be hearing a lot of different points about how we're trying to make that counselor be able to spend more time with children and more time with the children in greatest need uh, and distribute some of the other less important tasks across other automation and technology. Uh, data, I think you've already heard about the importance of data. And this is both dashboards, what's going on right now, as well as reports um, to, for, for every kind of reason. That's managing the helpline better, um, managing the staff of the helpline, the counselors better, uh, tracking the programmatic activities and reporting to the stakeholders of every kind, whether that's your your helpline funders, whether that's policymakers, whether that's the press and the like. And lastly, uh, as part of our End Violence Grant, um, we're doing something, we're doing several things specifically to tackle the online challenges that, that children face. Um, helplines get phone calls a lot about 
what people have seen online. They see a video of a child being sexually abused and they call the helpline because the helpline is there to stop abuse against children. So we're trying to help them, the helplines integrate into the larger CSAM and uh, sort of space. That's that's the managing the takedown uh, of the of online videos and, and photos of children being abused, as well as respond to abuse that's related to that. So now uh, a demo is often worth a thousand words, probably five thousand words. So um, Dee Luo, who is the um, uh, product manager for Salo, is going to be joining me, and she'll be sharing her screen as we go into a demonstration of a Salo. So um, this is a, a staging system of a Salo. So it has the functionality of a Salo, but there's actually no actual data of children on this system, uh, which is a child safety mechanism. So, because uh, we can't accidentally see uh, personally identifiable information about a child in crisis. So, um, so this demo is, um, we're gonna be pretending that we're Miriam, a counselor for Childline South Africa. And so much of the, uh, of the design you'll see is what South Africa is using, but some of it is also just sort of stock of Salo capabilities. So the first thing you notice is as soon as Miriam logs in, um, in the upper left hand corner, she can see how many people are actually waiting at the helpline. So we see there's a, someone waiting on Facebook Messenger, someone waiting on web chat, and how long the person who's been waiting the longest has been waiting. So what we can actually do is, is set ourselves to available. So that means that we're actually you know, able to take um, the first call. It routes automatically the person who's been waiting the longest, and then we can just check you know, a, 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 the checkbox and accept the call. And so now you'll notice uh, a lot of things are going on. And this is actually, you're now seeing everything that goes on in sort of a Salo if you're a counselor. And for, for one thing, it's all happening in one browser window. So this is a cloud solution. And so the idea is that in many cases, helplines have had one solution for taking phone calls and one solution is for web chat and one solution for, for dealing with social media and then a different place for doing data entry. In a Salo, you do all these things in one place. Uh, one of, the, one of the features of a Salo is also if someone has called before, we recognize them. And so you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner, um, we have a lot of contacts from this because this is a demo system and the same person calls every day when they're giving a demo. So, um, but uh, some helplines do not want to know this information. For example, anonymous helplines throw away this information. So this would not be functional um, for an anonymous helpline because for them, Every call is a new call and it's, a, and it's just one call. It's that, that's the one call that you handle. So, um, so let's go back to sort of the setup of the Salo. So in the left-hand side, you have sort of what's going on in the helpline overall. So there's still people waiting. In the, in the middle pane, you have a conversation going on. And we'll talk about that because there's obviously already a conversation going on. And then the right-hand side, we do that data entry, the, the programmatic tracking of what's going on at the helpline what are children calling about? How are we doing in responding to those needs? So let's go back to the middle pane, to this conversation. Um, so we have a chat bot and the chat bot um, asks questions of the incoming caller. Uh, and they can skip through this if they don't wanna answer. But first we wanna know, are they calling about themselves or not? Because if they're calling about a child, let's say a friend, <laughs> or, um, they can, they can actually, we'll actually collect data both about the caller and about the child that they're calling about. Um, and we can collect demographic data. In this case, we've asked how old and the gender of the caller. Um, and you'll notice that those answers got automatically filled into the, into the database. So this is, this is another efficiency mechanism um, uh, for this. Uh, matter of fact, um, uh, Childline uh, Zambia has been using this chatbot for a while and they just decided to, um, to add a new first question, which is which one of the eight major language uh, groups in Zambia do you speak? And then a Salo will switch into the preferred language and route you to a counselor who actually speaks uh, or, or can text in that language. So, so just imagine there's a lot of possibilities for what you could do with a chatbot, or you could decide that you don't want to use a chatbot. And I, I believe uh, Childline South Africa is not using a chatbot right now because they would rather just have you talk to a person. And these are again, the different operating philosophies. So, um, so what we can do is also say, uh, all right, well, what is, what is the child calling about? Um, and, and, and of course, a pretty topical question. Um, they're worried about COVID. 
So now the counselor can actually answer this question, but some questions get come up an awful lot and, and the COVID question comes up a lot. So uh, Childline South Africa already has canned responses to deal with COVID. So for example, we can go down here and say, okay, so COVID-19. And what will happen is a standard response about COVID-19 will appear in the counselor's texting window. And the counselor can edit this, right? So they could, they could add the child's name, they could uh, highlight um, something that they've already asked about. Um, so the idea is that we're, again, trying to make the counselor more efficient so that this information shows up in 10 or 15 seconds instead of a minute of typing. Um, so, so now we've given this young person a lot of information to digest. And, uh, and frequently um, conversations with children have some lags, especially when it comes to text. So, so another uh, efficiency feature is that it's possible for a counselor to take on more than one call. Um, and so uh, Miriam can just check, yeah, I'm ready for another task because I'm not busy right now. Um, now we have a, a chat request coming in and the same process has gone on. Um, so, so we can, uh, you know, we've learned out that this is an 11 year old girl um, and uh, we have gotten web chats from this IP address before. Um, and so, uh, and, and of course, if, if this was a, a real call, we could actually go and look at those past calls or cases and find out what's going on before. Sometimes there are people who call a helpline a lot. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so sometimes there's a protocol for someone who seems to call every day uh, so that they only get two to five minutes and then they can say, hey, you know, we really have other people we need to serve. Or it could be that it's important to know the context for this particular child. So, uh, so let's find out. Um, so, oh, so, so this, this particular issue is, um, is, is that an 11 year old girl has been chatting with a older man and he wants to meet. Um, this seems like a problematic situation. And so, so this is where we're likely to engage um, uh, additional follow-up with this particular uh, young person. So we, while we're having the chatting, we can go ahead and enter in the data about, about this child. And the required data here is, is, is based on what Childline South Africa wants. The data that's being collected here is what Childline South Africa wants, but it could be any set of questions. The anonymous helpline would be asking far fewer questions. Uh, so one of the important things in South Africa and many places is what province are they calling from? Um, yeah, so in this case, let's say, uh, let's say they're from the Western Cape, right? And so um, it knows about South African geography. And so you can now say, all right, so they're calling from the city of Cape Town. And now we also know what districts are. And so it turns out that often knowing where children are calling from is important in terms of who's going to do the follow-up and also for, for policymakers, right? You know, what kind of calls are coming in from this province or that province. So as we go along on the conversation, we collect the different elements of data, but now we switch to what's really important programmatically. And so now many helplines use different categories. So, so for example, uh, Childline Zambia and Childline South Africa actually collect rather different um, detailed categories. But what we do is under the hood, we align all of these to be on this, the Child Helpline International standard data framework. So even though they're answering, they're doing the categorization based on their operating philosophy and their context, their country, um, the same data will be under the hood so that we can aggregate this data across, across countries. Uh, today it's, annual, it's aggregated annually, but with a SALO, we could be aggregating it much more frequently. So let's decide what the category of this call might be. Uh, and so in uh, South Africa, okay, this is probably called grooming, right? Um, and so, and you can choose other categories as well. Uh, but so let's say we're now wrapping up this call. Um, and so now we can, add the notes of the counselor about the conversation that they actually had. Um, they can also do some quality sort of uh, assessment, like did, did, did the child feel like we solved their problem? Would they recommend this to a friend? Uh, we can also do this with a chat bot after the call or, or text conversation. Um, and there's two ways uh, in a case management um, sort of uh, helpline to handle a call like this. So anonymous helplines, you just, every, basically every call is a single case and it's just saved. But, in this case, um, we can say, all right, we, we counseled this child about, um, about COVID, that we, we would just save a contact and we'd be done. 
Um, but because this is something that we're likely to follow up on, we can create a case um, or, or yeah, we can open a new case. And then all of the calls and contacts that the helpline does are all in this case, which include maybe they reach out to the caregiver and maybe they reach out to the educator, maybe they reach out to a social worker. Um, and, uh, and this data is, is there for follow-up. It's also there to meet some of the obligations the helpline has. For example, with Childline South Africa, we're actually um, collecting the data that, that the South African police needs um, to actually complete the standard uh, reporting form for violence against children. So we're making sure that, that if you're actually going, if you actually are talking to someone about violence against a child, that you can collect the data that you need to actually go to the police and make a report as a helpline. So that's, um, that's pretty much what, uh, what the range of activities are that, um, that Miriam as a counselor can actually engage. And Dee, did I, did I miss anything important you wanna point out or we wanna shift okay. gears here? Okay. Got it. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do now is, all right, let's pretend that we're actually uh, Miriam's supervisor. And this is where the data elements come in. So uh, imagine that we have all this capability around two kinds of sets of data. The first set of data is running a helpline. And so all the standard dashboards and reports that any contact center would have, will have. So, you know, how many people abandoned uh, their call while waiting in the queue before they actually got routed to a counselor? Um, which counselors are maybe less effective or less efficient than some other counselors? Is that because they take the most serious calls or is that because they're not as effective and they need some training? So, so there's a whole bunch of sort of technology and data around sort of the operation of the helpline, quality control on the counselors, uh, and sort of that management challenge. But the really exciting stuff from, I think, from a lot of our standpoint is the programmatic data. And so here's a place where um, a supervisor or a manager can actually see what's been going on in the helpline. And the goal here is that, uh, is that any supervisor or manager can actually get the data they want over the time period they want about the people they want, um, see it real time, and then spit it out as a report if they need it. So for example, we could change uh, the time period to be uh, six months instead of, you know, yeah. So, and we could apply that and it automatically updates. I could be interested only in data about girls. And so I can actually, uh, you know, set that up and say, all right, this is, this is what girls have been calling about over the last six months. And then if I wanna know girls who are the age, you know, 12 to 17, I can go ahead and choose, choose that. And then I will see that particular subset. So the idea here is that, um, is, is that we wanna put the power to use the data in the hands of the people who are at the front lines of doing this, but also enable them to be able to quickly answer the questions that they get, whether that's from the chief executive of the helpline, whether that's from the governor of the province or the, um, or the, or the police force or the press trying to understand how COVID-19 is impacting children. So that's our demonstration. And, uh, and you know, we are going to actually be taking questions near the end of this. And so please put your questions in the chat box for that. And what I'm going to do is resume um, the PowerPoint and tell you a few more things about this before we get to some of our other guests. So, so let's talk about some key ASALO values. For one thing, we're not a typic, typical for-profit Silicon Valley software company. So the first thing is the data doesn't belong to us, doesn't belong to CHI. Um, it belongs to the helpline. And I think putting the power over the data, this critical data about children in the hands of the helpline in, who are in the country, oh, talking to the children, of, 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 of children this, has been, this is a really important shift in sort of how the power relationship works. What our job is, is actually make sure that we do the technical work to secure that data. So that means that we're, you know, we've had, um, you know, a silo has been audited by an outside security firm to make sure that we're actually doing this well. Um, we're also gonna be implementing um, the European GDPR, which is the, right now the most advanced privacy regulation uh, because we wanna help the helpline meet its obligations under GDPR. That means we have to build in all the capabilities that are required under that into a silo. This really is about partnership, right? We're here about co-creating this platform. It's a shared asset. It's actually open source. Uh, which means that all the helplines have the ability to go off and hire somebody else to run their helpline using a silo and improve it. And they don't even have to ask us permission. But our job is to do such a fabulous job of, of, of working with, with the silo 
that um, that they actually don't need to, uh, to to move on, but it's up to them. So now I want to bring in one of our key partners, uh, which is Patrick Krenz of Child Helpline International. And, and I think Patrick's gonna be you know, talking about the impact of, uh, of, of a CELO on their membership. And uh, Patrick, what, what would it mean to you and Child Helpline International if you know, a, a sizable number of your members were all, all using a CELO? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jim. Um, yeah, this is a, a very fundamental uh, question huh? um, after, uh, the explanation that Jeru, the founder of Child Helpline International, just gave to all of you in terms of her big dream and finding the right uh, tech people uh, to make this dream come true. Um, of course, it's, it's then very important uh, to uh, find the right uh, testers to um, uh, helplines, our members, uh, to see if the technology is working uh, as uh, we all foresee. Um, in this, in this whole exercise, I guess that, um, as was already mentioned before, the number of contacts is already huge, uh, over 30 million contacts uh, yearly. And um, I think that, and we think that as a network, the technology from Acelo um, will uh, actually increase the number of contacts um, that um, uh, will be attended. And uh, at the same time, um, as is already mentioned before, and as has been shown in the demo, uh, a better and new way that will also uh, help us as a network to uh, analyze and to see trends um, uh, earlier and um, uh, that will lead to, for example, a better way for us to set up advocacy and campaigning towards policymakers and decision takers. So also uh, on that side, uh, Acero is um, offering a lot of new potential and opportunities. And last but not least, I would say that um, the technology will also lead to um, better practices from our members and um, they will be able to improve um, the quality, quality of their services. And adding all this uh, uh, in, in some kind of a formula, have more contacts, more and better data, uh, better practices, I think it will all lead to what we are all aiming for and dreaming of, uh, more impact um, more children and young people who will be able to express themselves, to share their concerns, but also their great ideas so that we can create a better world for them. Well, well Patrick, I know that this is International Child Helpline Week. Um, and I know that you guys uh, have already done a lot of work around sort of highlighting what the helplines are doing. And for example, I know you just released a major report on COVID-19 and its impact on children. Could you tell us a little bit about that report? And then I'll, I'll think about you know, what would happen for the next pandemic. Yes, no, that's correct. Um, uh, this week is very important uh, for uh, the membership. Uh, last Monday on uh, uh, child, it was child, uh, was International Child Helpline Day, May 17, mm -hmm. where we actually uh, celebrate um, the, the great work that our members are doing. And um, at that day, we also launched our latest report about uh, voices during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you can download it uh, and look at it uh, on our website, uh, childhelplineinternational.org. So please go there and have a look. Um, it was uh, uh, also a huge exercise to pull all these data together. And um, yeah, this is maybe also something um, uh, uh, to mention um, related to Acero, um, the technology that we are using currently for capturing data and collecting data um, would, um, is, is also time consuming. And looking at the categories that we are using, uh, looking at the efforts from our data and research team to pull everything together, knowing that a lot of members use different technology different categories and different definitions, it does mean a use exercise to write data.
is that a sailor uh, will enable a new data collection um, reality uh, using the same categories, using the same definitions, mm -hmm. and being able to uh, to come up with campaigning and advocacy far more quicker than we can do now. Yeah. Well, I think you know certainly uh, you know a lot of cases uh, the helplines were collecting data about COVID nineteen on the side because there's you, they couldn't add this into their system, but. Um, of course, one of the benefits of a cloud system is if, if we'd heard from Child Helpline International and its members that you guys wanted to collect data yeah. on COVID-19 under one of the health categories, we could have added that in a couple of days. And then, as, as, as Patrick said, we would be actually collecting that data across um, a number of different countries. And, um, and you know, it would be easier to do this, let's say, even weekly or monthly across countries. Now, because the data belongs to the helplines, they actually have to give permission for that. But I think that there's such a, a solidarity in this movement that I think people are very excited about how they could use their data to, to do this. And, 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 and frankly, across the Child Helpline Network, and I think Jeru actually kind of mentioned this, uh, there's a ton of innovation going on. We're finding all sorts of cool technology out there among the CHI members, but, but most helplines are not in the business of providing software to other helplines. And so what we can do is, and, you know, frequently with their permission and encouragement, spread those kind of innovations across the network. So, so Patrick, any final thoughts before we actually talk about some of your members? No, just uh, to make the dream even bigger, uh, I guess, um, uh, lots of us, uh, whether uh, uh, from the technology side or from a, a humanitarian uh, um, welfare, well-being side, um, it, it would be great to to see this uh, dream become bigger and bigger. Um, we have to, to to start small, maybe, and and look within options and possibilities in the sector of um, uh, child protection. But it can even indeed become bigger, as Jeru already stated earlier. And how beautiful would it be? if this dream also entails something like a dashboard that we can look at, um, where a lot of organizations, not only child helplines uh, are uh, working with, and that this dashboard will tell us, if possible, real time, what the situation is, the well-being of our children and young people, that would be uh, even a bigger dream. Well, well, thank you, Patrick. And I think it's, uh, it's an exciting vision and we want to be the technical partner to that vision. So, so let me tell you a little bit more about the origin story. Um, so at, by being affiliated with Child Helpline International, um, we attended, I and our engineering director, Nick Hurlbert, attended the regional consultation of the Child Helplines in the MENA region and African region and Zanzibar uh, just a couple months before the pandemic hit. And so and the topic of that regional consultation was online child sexual exploitation and CSAM. So a very hot topic for, for this, this issue. And so we were all talking about this issue, what could be done, uh, the helplines were trading notes. And Patrick mentioned that the End Violence Fund was actually uh, had an RFP out that actually dealt with this, this issue. And so at that conference, that CHA conference, I talked to the chief executives of Childline Zambia and Childline South Africa, and we put in an application to the End Violence Fund, and they were already two of the 10 helplines that were testing a SALO, but they were willing to be the first two to go first if we could actually find the funding. And so thanks to the, to the grant we got from End Violence, um, a SALO has already launched in these two countries in, with Childline Zambia in February and Childline South Africa in April. And in both countries, we're taking a, a phased approach where we introduce sort of a SALO for data collection. And then we turn on different channels like, uh, like web chat or Facebook Messenger or, um, or, or WhatsApp. And, uh, and of course our biggest challenge uh, technically is, is routing the 116 short codes to, um, to a SALO. And we're busy working with the telecom companies in, in both these countries and the telecom authority to actually make that happen. But rather than me talking about this, this is our opportunity to actually hear from um, one of those chief executives. And I'm, I'm joined by uh, Dumisili Nawa, who's the national chief executive of Childline South Africa. And, and Dumi, uh, can, can you tell us uh, what it was like to be one of the early adopters of a SALO, uh, especially during its, its early days? We would love to hear from you. So Dumi. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And good afternoon. It is afternoon in South Africa to everyone on, on this um, session today. It is really an, an honor for us to be part of ASELO and, and one of the early countries, of course, to, to implement. Um, it, it, Jim, this has been really a, a wonderful experience for us as child in South Africa in terms of, as you have highlighted the different uh, features of ASELO and looking at our needs as child in South Africa and the challenges we have experienced in the past and really the, the magnitude of the changes that you have put in place, those have gone a long way in, in helping us as child in South Africa and our processes. For me, at the end of the day, um, yes, it is important for us to collect data and to have reliable data uh, for policy decisions and targeted interventions. But for me, it's important not to forget that child, that one child who makes contact with the helpline and who is speaking to a counselor, be it via text or, or, or phone call. And we want to make sure that our counselors are available for that and are 100% attentive to that process of attending to that young person, or even a parent who is worried about her child or a neighbor's child. So ASELO as a, a technical tool is helping us and helping our counselors uh, to be present in, in that aspect. Well, and, and thank you. Thank you, Jumi. I know that, um... You know, one of the one of the key things has been asking you how we can be more helpful. And I remembered uh, talking to, to you and and Florence Nakua, the, the chief executive at Childline Zambia, about what you were concerned about uh, as we were about to launch a silo. And you said you're not here. And of course, the pandemic made that much more difficult. But but we were actually able to hire a, a great technical person in South Africa. Uh, who's, who's actually now going to be providing local support. And I, I like to think not only for Africa, but also for Europe, because uh, she's in a much better time zone. So, um, but I think another exciting thing is that, is that you have a provincial structure um, and, that, and part of the idea of a CELO is that not only will it be working in the national office, but also you'll be distributing more. So can you talk a little bit about how your vision of, of, of supporting your, your provincial structure with a national structure is actually something that's important to you and, uh, and people of South Africa? Yes, certainly. And we have actually already, through ASELO and the funding that we've got, we've already started that process. Mm -hmm. As some of you might know, Child and South Africa um, has nine provinces and we all speak different languages and we have all our issues. But as the national office, we need to make sure that it is contained and, and children, wherever they are, they get the same service. So through ASELO, we are able to particularly focus on our text contact, mm -hmm. as in using our online platform to be able to reach out to children and interact with them. And through this process, we've already started to expand that aspect of our service to our Western Cape office, mm -hmm. where now we have counselors who have come in on board and the whole province in terms of exploring and working on our online platform. And in due course, that will be extended throughout uh, or to other provinces in the country. In essence, we are therefore expanding the contact we have with children and young people, not only via um, a phone call, but also using other platforms, as you indicated earlier on, Jim, young people are not so much interested in making a phone call, but they are present in social media. They, they use other ways of, of engaging. Yeah. Well, and the, and the last thing I want to want to bring up is, um, is not only uh, at the, as the national office, are you helping your provincial uh, partners uh, by expanding their technology and, and the range, but you're also helping helplines around the world. And I know, I know we've talked about, about dif different parts of the world looking to you. So uh, I just want to express our appreciation for being an early adopter, for working through the rougher spots at the very beginning, and also sharing what you've learned and your expertise with the other members of the helpline. So do, so do we, of the helpline network, do, we, do you have any final comments before we, we get to questions? Yes, um, thank you for that, Jim. And I think maybe we are probably risk takers. And then when it works, others say, okay, let's get on with it. <laughs> 
but it's also good to have uh, good partners with us who can hold us as we take those risks. But as, as a final comment, really, I think for us in South Africa, it has been really wonderful to see how technology can assist the human aspect of, of life, particularly children. We come from a, a human humanitarian social welfare aspect, mm -hmm. and we do not always interact with the IT technology people because we just think they come from a different planet. But just really a sense of them understanding our needs, integrating those needs, and developing a system that speaks to not our needs as such, but the needs of those who are our beneficiaries or interacting with is really highly appreciated. And we look forward to more developments in this space. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Jimmy. Well, I think we've had an exciting uh, jam-packed session and we have a few minutes for questions. And I know that people have probably been chatting questions. I'm gonna turn to, I think, Dee um, to feed me any questions. And then uh, as we reach the last three minutes of our time, um, I will go back to Howard for our closing comments. So, so Dee, are there a couple of questions that, that people have put in the, in the chat that you'd like me to tackle? Yes, I have some questions. Um, this is just a reminder for anyone, please, if you have any questions about Asalo or anything that Jim has talked about, um, just drop it in the chat and we'll feed them to Jim and our team will be on staff to answer any questions. So please um, put them in the chat. Um, Jim, first question. Um, you mentioned open source before a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that. So what does it actually mean that Asalo is open source and, and why is this important? Well, I think, I think it's more of a statement of transparency and values than anything else. Um, because you know, most helplines are not technical. So even though the source code is out there and they could make changes to it, most helplines aren't going to have that ability. But I think this is an important sort of risk management capability, uh, which is if it's open source, it's very hard for us to assert proprietary privileges over your data because you could just change the software and take your data. So, so we'll just make that easy. Um, it also gives us an incentive to do a better job um, so that so that uh, people want us to continue operating it. Because I think the, in, the, in the cloud era, that it's not just the software is open source, but it's also operating the service of having um, the helpline cloud operations doing this. By spreading this across dozens of helplines, we can have 24 seven support. We can have a people who are there just to make sure that the cloud infrastructure operates. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of balancing act, but I think it's first and foremost, a, a statement of values. This is a shared public asset. And, and if other people wanna take what we've built and go and take it into another field, we love that. That is actually one of our goals. So what's our next question, Dee? Uh, looks like we have a question in the chat from Rachel. Mm -hmm. um, how do you handle asynchronous chats and text interactions during the interactions with clients in a silo? So I guess, how do you handle multiple conversations in a silo? So, so for example, um, let's, let's assume that I have a couple of conversations going on simultaneously and, and the, the other conversation has had a chat. Um, a silo will show a red dot on that chat so that you know that the child or the person on the other end of the line has actually chatted. So, so that way you have some situational um, involvement. We've also implemented the ability to transfer chats um, to continuing counselors. So it turns out that if, 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 a, if a counselor unexpectedly gets into a very serious conversation, it's gonna take their entire con uh, attention, they can quickly transfer a chat to another counselor uh, quickly. And so, and then obviously we've, we've talked about um, canned responses, which is a pretty standard tool of, of modern you know, contact centers. So, so he is like, uh, how do we actually set these up for, for different functionality? And Dee, is there another feature you'd like to highlight or do you think that's a good start? That's a good start. Okay, so why don't you get ready for the next question? And by the way, if we run out of time for your questions, we actually do want to hear from everybody. And so um, you can check out asalo.org for uh, brochures in different languages, a, a demo video, a six minute demo video of this and write us an email at contact at asalo.org because um, we love to hear from helplines that wanna talk about how technology can help make them more powerful. So Dee, what's our next question? Okay, uh, next question about uh, access to internet. So what is the fate of children uh, with limited access to mobile phones or inability to use social media? So different helplines have tackled this in different ways. And it's important to realize that, you know, the average child in the world does not have a smart phone in their pocket. 
Um, and so, uh, for example, China and India has kiosks in many of the railway stations in India so that, so that children can come and actually ask for help off of a kiosk. Many of the helplines um, in, in, in sort of situations in, in countries, in places that don't have a lot of coverage in terms of technology have in-person outreach. So for example, uh, you know, uh, Childline Zambia does a lot of in-person outreach to schools, um, informing children, hey, you know, this, this kind of behavior is not okay. You have these rights. You should have, you should have the right to say no. Um, and so, so I think it's, a, it's kind of a blended situation where we want the, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a phone line or a kiosk um, or an app, great. Um, but we want to be able to support children being able to call in on, on different mechanisms or ask someone who has a phone to call in on their behalf. Or in many cases, I think, as you heard, someone, you know, concerned neighbor who's worried about the welfare of a child actually reaching out to the helpline and saying, uh, I'm going to speak for this, this eight-year-old who, who, who can't speak for themselves, but tell you that they, they need help. Uh, next question, uh, can a sale be modified to suit an organization's needs? Yeah, so, so basically we have a whole set of customization questionnaire sort of things that people fill out that say, uh, you know, we're in Canada and we want to have a queue where people speak English and we want French. Uh, now we're in Zambia, we're going to have eight different queues where, you know, where people speak different languages, um, where uh, we want to be an anonymous helpline, where we want to... Um, uh, where we want to use a lot of automation, we don't want to use a lot of automation. So, so the idea that this is all changeable, and this is all changeable as a configuration of a sale, no, no change to the actual software. These are just sort of like, here's the string that you, that you put in for this canned response is completely customizable to the, to the helpline. And yet the underlying technology will keep getting better. So when a helpline asks us to add, add a new feature, when that feature is working and they've tested it, um, we'll add it to a sale and every other helpline will have that feature available to them for free uh, because we don't have licensing fees, so. Um, okay, one more question. Actually, we'll do two more questions. Um, okay. After registering complaints or concerns, how does a sale intervene? So let's, let, let, let me clarify something. Um, we're the tech people. We don't take any phone calls. We don't answer any chats. That is the job of the helpline, our, our customer, the, the people who actually have trained counselors on the line and actually know what they're doing. So our job is to equip that counselor with the technology that they have. And so, so now, now that we know who's actually following up, right? what does a sailor do to help that? So, so let's take the example of a case, right? Uh, a child is called in or someone's called in about a child and it's serious, right? This child is in danger of harm or is being harmed. And so the helpline says, we're going to follow up. So they create a case. Now they often have best practices on how they follow up on this. So it could be that Childline India, you know, will quickly turn around and contact someone in that city to go check on that child. That's their pr protocol. In another place, it might be that they make a report to the police. Uh, or to the child protective um, uh, committee in that place. So, so what we do is we make it easier for people to actually do that follow-up and to make sure that the children are getting the attention they need and that supervisors can say, gee, this child was supposed to be followed up with two days ago and we don't have a report. Let's get on it right now. So, so we're trying to build the tools to make that kind of follow-up possible. And I know Dee, uh, if you have a quick question, great, but uh, I wanna make sure that Howard has has time to do our wrap up. So is, is there one more? Very quick question. Um, does Asalo have the ability to integrate with other case management systems? They ask, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is something that we've been asked for a lot and it is possible, it takes some extra work. And so we basically talk to each of the helplines about this, but often, for example, a government um, helpline often has a case management system that's in the larger social work system and we will need to work with this. And so, so this is something we'll do custom for each country and we expect to be doing this a lot in the coming months. Uh, so it's not just our built-in case management system. Well, thank you everybody for the attention. Thank you for all of our speakers for joining us. And I wanna turn it over to Howard for some, some closing remarks. Wow, 
Thank you. How on earth do I follow that? I think, first of all, let me just say a huge thank you to Jim, Giroux, Patrick, and Dumisele for sharing more about Asalo. And I think in doing so, you've shown us how it works and you've really inspired us, I think, with what it can achieve and the exciting plans for scaling the use and the impact of Asalo. It's really clear to, to me that Asalo is on track to transform the child helpline system and more. And so it's going to be great to see over the coming months and years about the increasing uptake in South Africa, in Zambia, and in other countries. And I think it's fair to say that in, in innovations like Asalo really matter because violence against children and abuse happens at an unimaginable scale. We know that every year, at least a billion children experience violence and abuse. And worse still, initial reports during the COVID-19 pandemic suggest that about 85 million more children have been placed at risk of violence and abuse, especially girls. And as Dumilisele reminded us, behind those big numbers, every one, every, behind every data point, it's an individual child. And every child, every call to a helpline really matters. And so this is not a problem that can be addressed without the proper data, without knowing uh, how and why children are experiencing violence and abuse. And the data enables the integration then of the evidence into the policy, the program design, the response. And that's why we have invested from the End Violence Fund in organizations like Tech Matters, creating scalable solutions like Asalo that are putting technology and data at the forefront of their response. And as I mentioned at the start of today's conversation, uh, today's event is uh, part of a series that's running throughout 2021, the Together to End Violence campaign and summit series. Together to End Violence, it's a campaign which uh, aims to unite people across continents, across sectors, but all behind a single shared vision of a world where every child can grow up safe and secure in every setting, safe at home, safe online, safe to learn, safe in their community. And Together to End Violence is an opportunity that we can all copy what we've heard today, the collaboration, the creativity, the innovation, work together to turn this shared vision of a world without violence and abuse of children into a reality. We can use the, the summit series to raise awareness that ending violence is possible, to do what we've done today, sharing cost-effective evidence-based solutions like Salo uh, that can have impact at scale, but also an opportunity to catalyze the very necessary leadership and financial commitments that are vital to end all violence, exploitation and abuse of children by 2030 as part of the Sustainable Development Goals. And without urgent unified action and that increased investment in the technologies, the services, the programs that protect children, we frankly really risk losing a large part of a generation of children to what can be lifelong consequences of violence and abuse. So we cannot let that happen. We are working to prevent that happening. And a SALO that was so inspired us today is just one way that we, as a global community are getting there. So let me finish by thanking all of our all of our mm -hmm. participants again and everyone who has joined us from across the world. We've learned more. We've been inspired. Thank you so much for everyone who's been behind the Salo and to all participants who have joined today's event. Thank you.